Jesus said, I will be with you. If you will only trust the Lord Jesus. said, I will be with you. Yes, I will. God is with us this morning. I will, will, will be with you. Hallelujah. If you only trust the Lord Jesus. If you only trust, just trust him. Because we know that the prayers of the righteous availeth much. We will open with prayer. The Reverend Jesse L. Jackson of the Rainbow Push Coalition. He is the founder. And then we will have an Old Testament, Dr. Mildred Harris from God First Ministries. New Testament, Pauline Montgomery. And then the Lord's Prayer, Melanie Martin Ware. Heavy, we, 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 we rejoice. Leon Finney. The mayor is here today. County Board President, Congress people, officials. But she service obligates us to be here today. We, we, we couldn't help but be here today. I was blessed to have met Leon. He came to school here in 1964. He was learning to be an organizer with an organization, Reverend Brazier, Paul Alinsky. Every major event in the last 50 years, he's been there. We sought to stop, we learned from becoming a slum. The development you see now, there's some Leon Finney in that. Of course, to go from one black congressman to three, Con Con Convention, he was there. We sought to build bread baths on the Dr. King. Marshall Benhausen, he was there. Chicago Press Boycott, near the groundwork for Harold Washington, he was there. When I became mayor, he was there. Remember the presidents, 84 and 88, he was there. Rock ran and won, he was there. Every major event the last 50 years, he has been there. Yeah. He's blessed us, God's blessed to have Leon in our lives. 83 years old. Methuselah lived to be 900. No schools named after Methuselah, no churches, no corners, no streets named after Methuselah. He lived 900 years about nothing. Leon made sense of his life. Mm -hmm. There's people there who have a balanced meal because of Leon. A place to stay. 
Jama job, dignity. We're here today because he obligates us to be here today during this difficult season. Pandemic 19, pandemic 16, 19, fires burning on the West Coast, south on the water, yet we're here today because your service has made us better. He really has fought the good fight. He kept the faith, run his race. I was blessed to have been with him, the Jim Montgomery. Three weeks ago we had dinner at breakfast at Beloit. He was planning for ultimate first vote to turn out. He never stopped working. So Christopher, you have a great legacy, a reason to be proud today. Yeah. Let us pray. Accept our prayer, dear God. Forgive us for our sins, for their many. And it's fine to overcome our indifference one to the other. Appreciate each other while we're yet living. Let us express our thanks to thee and to each other. Life is made better today because this your almost servant came this way. He made us stand up, march, fight back, a quest for dignity and justice. Thank you for his family. For the world and organization, mobilizing our people. We know it's difficult, yet nothing is too hard for you. Lord, see us through. They did us rejoice in thee. Eighty-two years of well-lived life, we thank you today. With glory, we thank you today. For every block organized, we thank you today. For every demonstration, we thank you today. Lord, now give him a resting place in your bosom. We know you can if you will. We know you can if you, if you will. Bless us and keep us. Through this difficult hour, yes. pandemic 19, yet we still come today to be with our brother beloved. We thank you, dear God. Bless this church, Bishop Smith. Thank you, Jesus. Bishop Brother Brazier, the family that's here today. Lord, keep us in, in your bosom. Amen. Well, good morning and praise the Lord. <laughs> Giving praise and glory and honor to God today. I am truly humbled to be able to stand before you and to acknowledge the angel of this house, Dr. Horace Smith, to the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, bishops, family, and friends, also elected officials and distinguished guests. I would just like to start off by saying, first of all, a, a couple of years ago, Doc invited me to be one of his guest speakers at one of the anniversaries that his church was holding at a church. And the theme was about building. And so as I spoke, and I was reminded by God, if you're gonna talk about building, you need to take something with you that denotes building, and so I brought a hammer with me. So today I'm bringing a hammer because God revealed to me that the Reverend Dr. Leon Finney was truly a builder, that he was. <laughs> Amen. A great builder, yes he was. So my scripture reading is taken from Nehemiah the second chapter, the 17th and 18th verses, it reads thusly. Now I want to say that I'm going to use the hammer 
as a prophetic act. And I'm going to use it, and when I use it, I want you to receive the resounding noise coming from the hammer, which is going to cause you to leave this place to build. Then said I unto them, ye see the distress that we are now in, how Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come, and let us build. Let us build up the walls of Jerusalem, that we be no more a reproach. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. And may the Lord bless you. And may as you leave this place, that you go out into your communities, in the city, the nation, and the world, and build. For the Lord is calling each of you. Thank you and God bless you. Good morning, church. My name is Pauline Montgomery, and I'll be reading from 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 through 58. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. Be thanks be, but thanks be to God, which given us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abound in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that you labor, that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Amen. for 
forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you. At this time, special remarks from my pastor, Dr. Byron T. Brazier of the Apostolic Church of God, and immediately following will be special tributes, a letter from the former President Barack Obama. Jaden Cook was the granddaughter of the deceased. Praise the Lord to everyone. Lord. To uh, Dr. Smith, the pastor of the Apostolic Faith Church, to Evangelist Knuckles, to the Apostolic Faith Church family, to the officials who are here, the mayor of the city of Chicago, Mayor Lightfoot, President Prankwickle, and I know there are others, uh, Alderman Dow and others, uh, and to this uh, family, I greet you in the only name I know to greet you in, and that is in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. I'll start out with a, just a very, I'll, I'll be very short, but I will say that Dr. Finney was my friend. Uh, I am 70 years old, and I knew Dr. Finney from the time I was 16. Uh, Dr. Finney was a part of our family life, a part of our family conversation. Uh, along with that was several of them that was in very deep and close relationship with my father. Uh, Allison Davis, who you'll hear from later, Dr. Finney, uh, Vince Lane, um, uh, Valerie Jarrett, and then my good friend, uh, Dr. Horace Smith. Uh, these are surrogate families of the Brazier family, of which Dr. Finney was one. And as we uh, approach this, I've heard it said that Dr. Finney was a complicated man. But if you knew him, you would know that he wasn't as complicated as you might have envisioned. If you knew that Dr. Finney was a Marine, that would be the first point. Not was a Marine, but is Marine. The second point is that he operated by a code. And his code first started out with loyalty, family, and people. Everything Dr. Finney did was those three things. You could depend on Dr. Finney no matter who you were or where you went. That was why when Reverend Jackson was saying he was here and he was here and he was here and he was there, it wasn't that that's what he, he needed to do or that what he wanted to do. He was loyal to people, to those who loved people, and he was loyal to those he called friend. When my father passed and I called Dr. Finney, he was the first call. He screamed, and I never heard a man scream like that, for it was a great loss. When I got the call, 
I felt the same thing. There's a piece of me that went out that was left because of his loss. So as we approach this life, Kristen and your children, the family Dr. Finney loved, his brother, there, there wasn't anyone that was more important to him than him. And Brother Cook, he loved you, he talked about you all the time. But his loyalty continued. Even though there were many things that came about in the newspapers and we would talk about it, there was a lot of newspapers going back to the 1970s. And I remember him telling me the story about him, his conversation with Bill Berry when he, when he first got written up in the, in the Sun-Times. And he said, I'm gonna sue him, I'm gonna sue him. He said, I'm gonna call my cousin, we're gonna sue him. His cousin is Jim Montgomery. So we're gonna sue him. And, and, and Bill said, Leon, sit down. He said, go do your job. He told me that story over and over again. He said, Byron, whatever you do, do your job. So as we approach this, as we approach this piece of understanding of the complexity of Dr. Finney, he never, I never saw him do anything for his own personal gratification. Whatever he did, it was for people. I, I wanted to, but I never did. I really wanted to ask him, why was he still driving that black Lexus? <laughs> he drove that Lexus into the ground. He never, he was, he was a modest man, but he was a man that had great impact. And I'll say this, that, that we who are his friends could care less about what was written about him. Dr. Finney belongs to us. May God bless you. To the family of Dr. Leon Finney Jr., Michelle and I were deeply saddened to learn of Dr. Leon Finney Jr.'s passing. We extend our heartfelt condolences and we want you to know that we are thinking of you all during this difficult time. Dr. Finney dedicated his life to building a bright future for all people on the south side of Chicago, and his impact will continue to ripple through the community we all love. He mentored and supported hundreds of ambitious leaders, including a skinny guy with big dreams. Doc was always there for us, just as he was always there for the people who called the city home. As the work continues to bring the Obama pres Presidential Center to Wollon, we stand on the shoulders of fierce activism Dr. Finney embodied during his life. I hope fond memories of his warm smile and signature bow tie bring you some comfort. And I hope you'll continue to draw inspiration from his words of love, support, and wisdom that will live on for generations to come. Sincerely, Barack Obama. The other floor again. looking at one of our future leaders, a man. The Bible says a little child shall lead them. At this time, it gives me great privilege to bring to you the mayor of the city of Chicago, the Honorable Mayor Lori E. Lightfoot.
Thank you, friends. Bishop Smith, First Lady, distinguished members of the clergy, elected officials, and members of the Finney family. I also want to take a brief moment to thank the Leak family who tend to us in our most difficult days. Thank you for everything that you do. <laughs> I bring you a message of condolences and prayers on behalf of the city of Chicago. It is a deep honor to be joining you here in this magnificent house of worship to celebrate the life and legacy of our brother, Reverend Dr. Leon Finney, who has been called home. The Lord's servant has found his rest. As difficult as this moment is for Dr. Finney's family, congregation, and countless other Chicagoans who knew and loved him, this moment is a true celebration of the incredible life of an iconic Chicagoan. Dr. Finney loved Chicago, loved our energy, loved our music, loved our politics, and loved fighting for justice and empowering the disempowered. Like many in his generation, Dr. Finney owned Chicago's story began in the South, in Mississippi, before coming here as a child during the Great Migration. For all of us born since, it's the Chicago this generation, Dr. Fenney's generation, helped create that has allowed all of us to rise and thrive, and on whose shoulders we stand today. Dr. Finney was many things, a minister, a community organizer, an entrepreneur, a father, and as Bishop Brazier said, a Marine. And the tie that bound all of these things together was his spirit and love and dedication to his community, his people, and public service. Now, Dr. Finney and I bump into each other from time to time in the public sphere. And I cannot say that we always agreed on every issue. But there was no denying that he had a keen intellect and was a brilliant strategist and who was always up for the fight. Dr. Finney had boundless energy that could only come from a deep love of his chosen life's work for his people in our city. And that is what drove Dr. Finney to do the great works that are part of his enduring legacy, to give voice to the voiceless and leave our city better than when he found it. That is exactly the kind of legacy you'd expect from somebody mentored by the great Bishop Arthur Brazier. Tutored by the legendary Saul Alinsky, and as Dr. Finney would tell you, toughened up by the Marine Corps. He extended that wisdom and training throughout his life. And the countless black pastors he trained um, in partnership with the McCormick Theological Seminary to the Woodlawn organization he created and led to become one of the most respected community organizations in the country. And of course here. His legacy, his footprints, his fingerprints are all over so many important organizations, initiatives, and people that are leading yet today. It seems fitting that Reverend Finney was called home in this moment while our nation undergoes our own reckoning around racial equity and justice. As we take up the mantle of his cause, we still have a lot to learn from this man and how we seek to make our city fairer, better, and more inclusive, which is the challenge he left for us and the challenge we must take up with the same kind of de determination and gusto in which he lived his life. We owe that to him. We are his legacy, and we must be worthy of that mantle. We must realize the dreams of the generation that he loved. 
In closing, I want to say this has been a challenging time for our city, but reflecting on the legacy of Dr. Finney, who touched so many lives and made such a difference in every community in which he dwelled. These are the kind of things that we must take in and reflect upon to give us hope and determination and energy to move forward. Rest in power, Dr. Leon Finney. Thank you. God bless you, Mayor. You are always in our prayers. At this time, we have three videos. Governor J.B. Pritzker, State of Illinois, President Tony Prinkwinkle, Cook County Government, Congress Bobby Rush, United States Congress of the First District of Illinois, and immediately following the videos will be the reading of the obituary, Chelsea Smith and DeAndre Anderson. It's truly an honor to share in this sad occasion with you all, the family, the friends, and the vast network of people whose lives were touched by the life of Reverend Dr. Leon Finney, Jr. This is a tragic loss for so many, but his commitments to community and the real change that he brought to those around him live on. In the Woodlawn Organization, in the church, in Leon's barbecue, in the veterans community, and in the work of the many organizations and advocates who sought his counsel and advanced his work. Doc Finney was a leader, an organizer, guided by the willingness to bring change to those around him. His perseverance to always get the job done, teach those around him to lead with love, and be an advocate for those who need it most, are some of the many reasons so many loved and respected him and why I wanted to honor his legacy. On behalf of the people of the state of Illinois, I want to offer my condolences to all who grieve this loss and my hope that his accomplishments and legacy of building community will live on. Again, my deepest condolences to all who mourn. I'm privileged to be here today to speak of a man who so vividly shaped this community, all of Chicago and the nation. I didn't know Leon Finney when he was a young organizer in Woodlawn, inspired by the words and actions of Saul Alinsky. I didn't know him as a welfare organizer, nor did I know him in his earliest fights to preserve and create more affordable housing, whether his adversary was an expansionist University of Chicago or a segregationist city hall. In fact, while I knew of his feats, it was not until I was elected alderman of the Fourth Ward in 1991 that I met Dr. Finney. I knew him as a leader with Bishop Arthur Brazier of the Woodlawn Community Development Corporation. What was distinctive about Leon and the organization he and Bishop Brazier created was that they not only demonstrated and fought to create affordable housing on the south side of the city, they actually developed the expertise and partnerships to make that happen. He was a man of many talents. Street Smarts made Leon one of the city's most legendary and prolific organizers. His ability to analyze a situation, frame the issue, and organize around it by any means necessary. His inner sanctum skills that made him a canny player in the halls of power, an outsider's insider, an insider's outsider. But mostly to me in the 30 years I knew and worked with him, he was a trusted and reliable friend. As a developer, he distinguished himself in my ward by the fact that his word was his bond. We didn't always see eye to eye, but at the end of any debate, we found common ground and worked together for the common good. As an organizer, here too, his word was his bond. In every campaign, whether it was electoral or around an issue, when Leon said he was in, he was in. When I needed to understand the lay of the land, what was happening behind the scenes, what forces were at work, I went to Leon 
because of his astute understanding and wellspring of deep-held beliefs in fairness and honesty, and I knew I could rely on him. If I needed help organizing a rally, I could count on Leon for 100, 500, 1,000 people if needed. If I needed to take the temperature of a community on an issue, I could turn to Leon. And if I needed fundraising, while he was not a man of wealth, I could count on Leon to do his best to tap those who were and make my case. It's important that we here today honor the man who dedicated his life to justice. The man who understood that if we want justice, we can't be beggars. We have to organize and fight for the community and the country we envision. We've lost a number of great fighters for justice this year. Leon was the one I knew best. It is with deep sadness that I am here today. First of all, I want to extend my deepest condolences to the family of Dr. Leon Finney, Jr. My deep-seated sorrow for the loss of Leon is only balanced by my admiration of the committed life that he lived. Leon was more than a friend. He was a stout-hearted, courageous, and tireless fighter and an inspirational role model to us all, me in particular. He was not only my professor at the McCormick Theological Seminary, he was a sharing pastor to the needs of my church, the beloved community, Church of God in Christ. We are all left with inspiring thoughts, firm commitments, and unrelenting courage because Leon bequeathed us all with those qualities. And he expects nothing less from each of us. May Leon rest in peace. And as he would often say, carry on, carry on. Carry on. God bless. Hi, I'm Chelsea Smith, honored to be Kristen's sister friend. Reverend Dr. Leon Dorsey Finney, Jr., activist, family man, civic leader, pastor, mentor. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue, or walk with kings nor lose the common touch. If neither foes nor lo loving friends can hurt you, if all men count with you, but none too much, if you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and everything that's in it. And which is more, you'll be man my son, Rudyard Kipling. It was the late 1960s. Morning traffic was backed up to a standstill for miles as the Dan Ryan slowed to a halt. In distance, a man with a loud bull horn shouted, we demand equal opportunities for city jobs and contracts. No one goes to work until we all have the same opportunities. Mayor Daley, what say you? Labor unions, 
what say you? A fighter for rights, equality, equal opportunities, and fair housing. A fighter for black and brown people. A fighter for justice. Leon Dorsey Finney Jr. always stood for what was right and equitable for all. It was the core of his being. As a young man, Leon was talented in exerting pressure on all levels of the establishment to ensure that people were treated fairly in the most essential areas of their existence. Jobs, food, shelter, safety, and education. Leon was a master negotiator and had a reputation for never backing down, a power broker for those who were not given a fair shake. Leon would commonly be seen in the middle of a protest, and we now have a name for it, community organizing. He stood with the likes of Saul Alinsky, Bishop Brazier, and Jesse Jackson. He dedicated his life to communi community organizing. His role as a pastor was a proud member of a Kappa Appa Phi fraternity. He frequently shared the old adage, if you stand for nothing, you will fall for anything. He was steadfast in his principles, but charismatic in the delivery. Leon dedicated his life to ensuring that his dash between 1938 and 2020 was spent serving others. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Proverbs 22, 6. Leon Dorsey Jr. Sorry, Leon Dorsey Finney Jr. was born, as he would say, on the seventh day of the seventh month, 1938, in Louise, Mississippi, to Adeline Jones Finney and Leon Dorsey Finney Sr. While he spent his early years of his childhood in the South, like many Amer African Americans, his family relocated to Chicago as a part of the Great Migration when he was a toddler. As his family worked to establish roots in their new urban environment, Leon's mother died from tuberculosis when he was just five years old. His life is truly representative of the African proverb, it takes a village to raise a child. In the absence of his mother, he was reared in his early years by his great aunt Bertha, Bertie Montgomery. As a strong nurturer that represented the fullness of love, he learned to be grateful as a child of God and developed his charismatic social skills on the weekends from his aunt, his great aunt, Diella Montgomery Parker. Leon also spent a few years in Nashville, Tennessee, where he lived with his grandparents who taught him to love learning and the power of education. Leon attended Hyde Park Academy High School while working at his father's restaurant, Leon's Barbecue, which once also served as an after-hours supper club. Leon learned all aspects of the store, as it was fondly called, including making gumbo on Fridays for late night customers, dusting chicken, cooking the ribs just right, and of course, the recipe to the infamous Leon's barbecue sauce. Like his father, Leon Jr. had an unrelenting work ethic. He learned invaluable problem-solving skills, the value of a dollar, and always had to think outside of the box when it came to money. His father, Leon Sr., never gave him the total amount of money needed for anything, including books or clothes, but instead would give him 50% and tell him to figure out the rest from his own earnings. The important lesson of self-reliance was drilled into him at an early age. Upon graduating from high school in 1957, Leon attended the University of Illinois, followed by faithfully serving his country in the United States Marine Corps. During his enlistment, he worked in counterintelligence and spent time in San Diego at Camp Pendleton. This experience left a significant imprint on his being that he carried through his life experiences. He always approached situations as a Marine, Semper Fidelis, which embodies the promise to always remain faithful no matter what one encounters.
After being honorably discharged from the military, Leon began working in banking and finance at the First National Bank of Chicago as a commercial paper trader. He was coined an up-and-comer that had great promise until he had lured away by the need for a deeper community connection. True to his love of learning, he later went on to earn post baccalaureate degrees in economics, urban community development, theological studies, and public administration from Goddard College, McCormick Theological Seminary, and Nova University, respectively. For even the Son of Man did not come expecting to be served by everyone, but to serve everyone and to give his life as the ransom price in exchange for the salvation of many. Mark 10, 4. Hello, I am DeAndrea Anderson. As a young man, Leon knew his greatest joy came from serving his community. He was trained in the art of community organizing by the legendary organizer, Saul Alinsky, and recruited to the Woodlawn Organization by Bishop Brazier in 1964. In 1967, he was promoted to executive director based on his hard work, and in 1969, became the president. His vision helped lay the foundation of the organization and solidify TWO as a voice for the African-American community. Under his leadership, TWO led the fight against social and economic discrimination. From citing property owners who were deemed slumlords in the Woodlawn area to organizing boycotts and marches, Leon was staunchly committed to tearing down the barriers that hindered African-American progress. He was quoted once saying, we are about building communities because nobody can be an island unto themselves. It would become his life's work to support the continuous revitalization of the Woodlawn community and its surrounding areas, and he did just that. Making TWO and its development arm the Woodlawn Community Development Corp, at one point in time, the largest nonprofit African-American housing management company in the United States which employed more than 400 African Americans. Leon noted some organizations focus on building and managing real estate. WCDC expands upon this idea to include developing people and creating a psychological sense of community. In 1979, Leon was appointed as a member of the Chicago Planning Commission by then Mayor Jane Byrne. This further solidified his position as a respected leader and driving force of Chicago's urban redevelopment. During the early 1980s, Leon was a force to be reckoned with and was intimately involved in working with a multiracial coalition to get the city's first black mayor elected, Mayor Harold Washington, in 1983. In 1988, he retired from his position as head of TWO, shifting gears to use his voice on the national stage as the state campaign manager for Jesse Jackson during his bid for the Democratic presidential nomination. Leon would continue to be sought after and serve as counsel to influential local leaders such as Rahm Emanuel and Tony Preckwinkle, as well as national leaders including Carol Mosley Braun and Barack Obama. Reverend Finney's involvement in Chicago remained steadfast throughout his life as he served as the, pres as the vice chairman of the Chicago Housing Authority, sat on the board of trustees for the Chicago State University, board of trustees for the YMCA, and was a member of the Chicago Planning Commission. He also founded Christ Apostolic Church and served as its pastor until the church merged with Metropolitan Apostolic Community Church, or the Met, in Bronzeville where he served as senior pastor. The church became a city landmark in 2007, once he saved the Met from being demolished. Despite all that he accomplished and all the honors that were bestowed upon him, Reverend Finney believed it wasn't enough to just lead, to truly make an impact. He believed one needed to teach and build a legacy. 
This was evidenced through his creation of programs that develop future leaders like the African American Leadership Program at McCormick Theological Seminary, where he taught African American leadership studies and was responsible for training countless African American pastors receiving their master's degree. He also taught at the University of Chicago Lutheran School of Theology, the University of Illinois, Northwestern University, Presbyterian College of Career, and the Theological College of the Bahamas. He also authored several publications on economic and social development. Children's children are a crown to the aged, and parents are the pride of their children. Proverbs 17.6. To the city of Chicago, Reverend Finney was an activist, businessman, and man of the cloth, but to his family, he was a dutiful son, loving father, grandfather, papa, and loyal brother. He actively worked to preserve the legacy of his late father, Leon Finney Sr., through his renowned restaurant, Leon's Barbecue, which originally opened in 1940. Though the family sauce recipe remained a secret, Leon's love for the community was well known throughout the city. He consistently hired and trained those who lived in the neighborhood, needed job opportunities, and actively supported military and veteran organizations. He was a constant presence at the restaurant and often could be found behind the counter working side by side with his staff. Leon Dorsey Finney Jr. and the late Sharon McGoffey Finney had two children, Kristen and Leon Dorsey III, Trey. He played an active role in both of his children's lives and was doting hands-on grandfather to Jaden, Ava, and Gerald Liam. He made sure they had a front row seat to what it meant to give back to their communities and build upon the Finney family legacy. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Matthew 25, verse 23. On September 4, 2020, after a lifetime of service and dedication to social justice, Reverend Dr. Leon Finney Jr. was called home. He was preceded in death by his parents, Leon D. Finney Sr. and Adeline Jones Finney the mother of his children, Sharon McGoffey Finney, and their son, Leon Dorsey Finney III. He is survived by his daughter, Kristen Finney Cook, son-in-law, Dr. Gerald Lindsay Cook, three grandchildren, Jaden, Ava, and Gerald Liam, siblings, Gwen, Zenobia, Renee, Michael, Michelle, and Andre, former wife, attorney Georgette Greenlee, cousins, attorney James Montgomery, Warren Jones, and former Secretary of Agriculture, Michael Espy, Henry Espy, and many more loving cousins, nieces, nephews, and family friends. Thank you. Amen. Let us stand all over the building. Let us stand. And let us celebrate and applaud the life and the legacy of this great man of God who has served his country, his community, his church, his family, his friend. We celebrate and we applaud the life and the legacy of the Reverend Dr. Leon Finney. Let's applaud him. Hallelujah. God bless you. You may be seated. I'm reminded of the old song that says, If I can touch somebody as I pass along, then my living will not be in vain. At this time, musical selection by Melanie Martin, Ware and the AFC Praise Team, To God Be the Glory. Then following, we will have special video tributes from Frank Clark, ComEd retired chairman and CEO, John W. Rogers Jr., Ariel Investment CEO, James Compton, Chicago Urban League retired CEO, Allison Davis, special friend, Marlon Katz, MK Communication CEO.
say thanks for the things you have done for me. Things so undeserved, yet you give to prove your love for me. The voice says of a million angels cannot express my gratitude all oh, that I am and ever hold to be I owe it all to thee to God be the glory to God be the glory My name is Frank Clark. Today, I join a chorus of voices celebrating the life and legacy of Dr. Leon Finney. Let me first describe his life as I witnessed it. I saw a man whose first and last daily thought was what can I do to eradicate racial and economic discrimination that so blames 
enclaves the uh, black community. What can I, Leon Finley, do to make plans, form strategies, implement change today so black people would see a truly better tomorrow? He carried his burden of leadership each day of his adult life. Some days it almost broke his back. But I can tell all of you, he always found the faith and the strength to straighten up and carry on. Dr. Finney's life can be summed up in a few words. He was his brother's keeper. His legacy lives on. Dr. Finney is a founding member of the Business Leadership Council, an organization that focuses exclusively on growing black businesses and supporting black entrepreneurs and identifying and developing new black leadership. It was established a decade ago with a handful of men and women. Today, it hosts over 130 members in construction, financial services, accounting, legal, insurance, public relations, security, banking, and other businesses. So, Dr. Finney, you can rest now, but your legacy lives on. Thank you. The former Congressman John Lewis always talked about the fact that if you see something that's not right, that's not just, that's unfair, we all have a moral responsibility to fight for justice, to do the right thing. Dr. Leon Finney was someone who fought for economic justice for all of us. He had a passion for our people. He loved our people. He wanted us to be treated fairly. He worked so extraordinarily hard on behalf of all of us. Dr. Leon Finney was a role model for me. He was someone that I saw fight so hard for all of us with so much passion and so much energy. I feel fortunate to have had Dr. Finney in my life and to be able to call him a friend. It is a privilege for me to be able to participate in this service this morning. And I do offer my condolences to Christian members of the immediate family, to Dr. Finney's extended family, and to his many colleagues and friends, among which I include myself. I first met uh, Dr. Finney in either 1965, 1966, somewhere in that time period when he was an organizer with TWO and following the Solinsky teachings and guidance and leadership of uh, Dr. Brazier. It was at this point that Dr. Finney and I became very close colleagues, friends, partners and supporters of one another and our respective organizations. As a community organizer, he was most helpful to me and most helpful to the Urban League. Uh, he was a master and uh, certainly could gather and assemble people on almost a moment's notice, which is something he did for me on more than one occasion. I remember in the mid-1970s, uh, we had embarked upon a voter registration effort at that time. And of course, this was several years before the election of uh, Harold Washington as mayor in 1983. And uh, we entered into an agreement with the Board of Election Commissioners where the Chicago Urban League could register voters in public libraries. Uh, but near the time that the decision was to be finalized, one of the commissioners decided that he was not going to support that effort, upon which I uh, called Doc Finney and told him of my concerns and problems. So uh, Doc Finney immediately organized people to uh, attend the decision-making meeting and when I told him that uh, I thought maybe 25 to 50 people would be sufficient, he comes with several busloads uh, bus of people with about 500 people, which was really the decisive factor in the decision of the Board of Election.
Leon Dorsey Finney Jr. What do I remember? I remember we met 68 years ago. We both lived on Langley, about three blocks apart. We both attended Hyde Park High School. We raised our families, had dinners together, vacation together. And who could forget how Leon revolutionized the taste of Chicago with Leon's. Hugely popular, gave meaning to the taste of Chicago. White folks didn't know what barbecue was until Leon's came to the taste of Chicago. I remember we went on a family ski trip and uh, out in Colorado. So we were all, there were eight of us, Leon's family, my family. We were in this van about a half an hour outside of Denver. Leon disappears in the back of the van. And uh, he emerges with freshly pressed slacks, a crisp new dress shirt with a bow tie and a sport coat. The rest of us are in jeans and cowboy hats and sweaters. And I said, Leon, what's this all about? He said, you know, I expect to be treated first class. And in order to be treated as first class, you have to look first class. So that was my man. He always, always, always was <clears throat> looking out for his and others' self-interest. Finally, another favorite quote of Leon's, those who profess to favor freedom and yet to appreciate agitation are men who want crops without plowing up the ground. I love you, Leon. Good afternoon. This has been a year of great loss for those of us who are committed to creating a more just world. John Lewis, C.T. Vivian, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Bobby Lee, the list goes on. And while moved and shaped by each of these folks, only Leon Finney was my friend, my brother, my comrade. I first met Leon in 1965, I a young college student, he more seasoned. I, an avowed Marxist, working with SGS. He, an Alinsky-trained organizer, working for TWO. But united by our commitment to seeking empowerment and justice for those without either, we found and created a common bond. In those heady days of the 60s, we marched together, battled together against the Daily Machine, the University of Chicago, the welfare system, the war in Vietnam forging a bond of unity one to another and to our counterparts. From Czechoslovakia to Mozambique, from Paris to Mexico City, from Mississippi to Palestine. Those bonds, that trust never changed. From the time I returned to Chicago in 1979 to a mere six weeks ago, there was not a battle to be fought or an election to be won during which I didn't turn to Leon for his thought and partnership. Not that it was always fun. Those who know us well know about our famous and vocal fights. Not about principles, but about strategy and tactics with both of us totally committed to our point of view. But in the end, we always came back together and did whatever had to be done. And that's the thing, big or small, Aside from family and girlfriends, Leon was the one person upon whom I could always rely to tell me what he thought, to commit or not to commit, but once committed, never waver. Quite a rarity. In a city of challenging and changing loyalties, in a time and an arena that too often fosters fear, Leon was a stalwart, never backing down, just because the odds didn't look that good. In fact, I think he particularly enjoyed 
showing others the folly of their timidity. Leon for sure had its critics, that all here know. But I have found always that most of the men have been ignorant and arrogant, unwilling to recognize exactly what he accomplished. Would there be affordable housing in Woodlawn today without Leon? Would Harold Washington or Barack Obama have been elected? Would there be breakfast for children? Would be, there be Head Start? All of these things that Leon pioneered while a young organizer. We are now faced with one of the most difficult and momentous periods of our lives. And each day when I wake, I almost by instinct go to the phone to call Leon and then I remember that he's not there. I can only hope that over these 50 years of friendship, I've learned enough from him to demonstrate grace under fire, tenacity when everything seems hopeless, and a readiness to smile about the challenges that I face, about the terrible odds, and most of all, smile with an appreciation for life that has been given to us and we should enjoy. Thank you. You will be missed. He is missed. What a tremendous tribute to an awesome man of God. We are just so grateful to have had the opportunity for him to be a part of Chicago, Illinois. At this time, Hermine Hardman, Indigo Publishing from CEO, special tribute, Warren Jones, the cousin of the deceased, and then a video Representative Mike Epsey from the Mississippi District Number Two. Thank you. Good morning. Bishop Smith, thank you so much for having a church large enough for us today to practice social distancing. I want to tell you about the gentleman from Woodlawn. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg made a statement that perfectly describes the life of Dr. Leon Finney Jr. She said, we should learn to do our best for the sake of our communities and for the sake of those whom you paved the way. That's a perfect sentence to describe Dr. Leon Finney. Leon was my friend. I was mentored by Leon. He became a confidant of Leon. Byron, Leon was complex. I take issue with you. But he was complex because you never knew which Leon you were talking to. When he made those early morning calls, Christian, six o'clock, regular, wake up call, we got to do something. I didn't know if it was the minister Leon, the politician Leon, the organizer Leon, or my friend. He was strong, he was fierce. He was loving, he was a fighter, he was not going to back down, no matter what. He had a strong, disciplined, steel mind. When he focused on something just like the Marine he was, he didn't back it up, and he usually won even if he lost. When his family came here from Mississippi, they settled in Woodlawn. He never left it. He was Woodlawn's champion. He was Woodlawn's leader. He was Woodlawn's guardian, and he fought for it. He learned from Saul Alinsky the art and the science 
of community organizing, he is Selinsky trained. His mentors, Bishop Arthur Brazier and Bill Barry. He was a real community organizer. We use the term so flighty now. We use the term activist so flighty now. Leon is the definition of it. When I say he fought for Woodlawn, that means anybody and everybody that came that way. He fought the University of Chicago when they tried to cross the midway, he backed them up. Stop, go home, not your turf. We own Woodlawn and we're gonna keep it. No trespassers here. But he also fought the games. And that's what I remember most about this man as a fighter. He fought the Blackstone Rangers, Jeff Ford, Larry Hoover. I was a college student. I'm a breadbasket baby. And when Leon was fighting the games, Willie Barrow, Jesse Jackson, Bishop Brazier were nervous and scared because they were bad. They were burning down buildings and they were extorting. Leon, with his crazy self, was challenging them, telling them to stop, and that this is Woodline and we, we just can't have it. Now here's the dynamics of it. Leon was meeting in the alley, in the garage, and Bishop Brazier finally got him at the church and that was a safe ground. Jesse was always worried about where was Leon because nobody knew where he was and if something happened, we would not have known what to say or who to say or how to account for him. Oh yeah, that's the truth. And here's what Leon would say. They are ghetto gang boys. I'm a Marine. I'm a man, and some teenage boys are not, will not, cannot run this community. Now, I don't know what those meetings were because Leon was in those meetings by himself, but he stopped them. He understood the dynamics of power. He understand the position of politics. Politics was a tool. It was a tool for embetterment and empowerment. He was an essential worker. He was an essential worker for us, for black Chicago. And when you are bringing about social change, not talking about it, not preaching about it, but doing it, they throw darts at you. And that's where Leon and I kind of bonded. I hated when these newspapers would tear him up for something he did, and that became my fight. We cannot let these white folks define us and discuss us without our definition. As he moved through the city's top political circles, he made friends and he made enemies, but clearly he was about the business of Chicago's black community being better. He was a leader of black Chicago, he was a leader of Chicago. Let's not reduce him to just the South Side or Woodlawn. Not so. There's not been a politician, black or white, in the last 50 years who've not knocked on Leon's door for support, for help, for resources, for advice. Let's talk about the wonders of his campaign. Leon didn't just start campaigning yesterday. You all remember police brutality, not new. There was a congressman, Bobby, his name was Metcalf. There was a doctor, his name was Odom. Police stopped them. And in stopping them and harassing them, they were told you were black men in black suits and black Cadillacs, and they were arrested. Leon Finney picked up that mantle and began to bring some change about. Now, Leon argued a lot. Christian, some people might tell you debate, but your daddy argued. 
and he was fierce. He would make you cry. He would make you cuss. He would make you hang up. But this is how Leon ended a real good argument. I have gotten into so many fights with Leon. And in about 15 minutes, he would call back and say, hey, Herman, let's go for dinner. And I said, I don't want to have dinner with you tonight. He said, I'll be there at 6 o'clock. Sometimes he would call Jeanette and say, now, Jeanette, this is what she said, and this is what I said. What do you think? And then we would start to fight all over again at dinner. The political campaigns that Leon worked on, they were not just campaigns. They were historic. They were epic. Carol Mosley Braun did not have a chance, an idea, or a thought that she could be a United States Senator. Leon Finney galvanized the black community with an emphasis on black women to say, we can make her a U.S. Senator, and we did. And Leon ran that campaign almost by himself with pull and struggle and little money, and lo and behold, we won. It was historic. The first, the only black woman to date in the United States Senate. Next campaign, Harold Washington, you know about. Jesse Jackson had the bright idea that he was going to run for president. People told him he was crazy. He shouldn't. He couldn't. He wouldn't. And Jesse had went around the country actually looking for others to run, making his case on the numbers of the black community and how we could win. He had the strategy, but he didn't have the candidate. Jesse was really trying to get Andy Young to run. Conversation with Leon, and Leon said, Jesse, you need to run for president. The rest is history. Leon became the field director for Illinois of that campaign. And why Jesse run, Jesse run, we ran. One day in the office, we had bags of uh, mail. You all know those big old bags, the mail ring? And they were packed. They were like from the floor on up. And the discussion was money. We were running out. And we were crying and pulling out hair and where and who and how. And Leon said, Herman, get one of those bags down and let's open up that bag. That, that mail shouldn't be up there that long. We've had these bags in here for too long. Opened up a bag. Miss Jones from Alabama wrote a letter to say, Reverend Jackson, I saw you on TV last night, and I liked what you said. Here's $25. Opened up another letter. Reverend Jackson, I saw you in the debates last night, and you talked about that man in Africa, Nelson Mandela. Here's $50. We kept opening six bags, Six million dollars. Leon and I stayed up all night and half of the next day with the door closed. Leon closed the door and locked it. Wouldn't let nobody in until we finished. I will not tell you what people said. It does not matter. When we opened up that door, we had six million dollars. Cyrilla Maxwell said, what did you and Leon do? Where did you get the money? And I told him I raised it. <laughs> the election of Barack Obama, historic. I don't know if it would have happened without Leon. 
We needed Indiana. We needed to carry Indiana. And Leon said, we can do it, and we're going to take Chicago to Indiana. That's how we do it. And on Saturdays, I think they, start, they started on Saturday, but it ended up Thursday, Friday, Saturday, busloads went to Indiana, knocked on doors, made the phone calls, and the rest is history. Leon, the minister. When Metropolitan Apostolic Community Church was in danger of foreclosure, Leon took the church. He called me and he said, I'm going to need your help. I'm going to take this church. I'm going to restore it, da, 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 da. And I said, why are you taking a church, an old church? What is wrong with you? you? I mean, you just ain't got nothing to do. Why don't you go join Byron? Why don't you go join Horace? Why? He said, no, I got to take this church. Here's what he said. He said, Herman, this is why I got to take the church. It's historic. It's our church. It's our community church. You got to realize what this church has done. And we can't keep throwing away history. This is the church that A. Philip Randolph organized Pullman Porters. This is the church where Marian Anderson sang when she couldn't go to the opera house. This is the church that Paul Roberson performed in when he couldn't go downtown. This is the church where Dubois taught. This is the church that Eleanor Roosevelt and Thurgood Marshall came to visit. This was their Chicago home. I said, I got it, and I'm with you. And he built that church. Leon went back to school after conversations with Bishop Brazier. He was career restless, and he wanted to be a lawyer, or he wanted to be a minister. On Bishop Brazier's good advice, he went back to school for theology. In doing so, he taught others, and he brought along 300 ministers with their degrees and masters of theology and philosophy or doctorates. That's the way he thought. It wasn't just him. It was always us. We will miss Leon. This city will be lonely without him. He raised issues. He fought the fight. And he brought us along when it was time for him to do so. And it meant something to us. Byron, you're right, he was ours. He was our Leon. He was the gentleman from Woodlawn. Thank you. His life, his legacy. Yes, yes. To God be the glory for the things he has done. Hello everyone, this is Mike S.B., our cousin, to our dearly departed uh, Reverend Dr. Leon Finney, Jr. So I'll be here in Jackson, Mississippi, wishing that I was there with you in Chicago. So to Kristen and all the Finney family, all relatives of uh, Leon, Jr., to Governor Pritzer, to Congressman Barbara Rush, to Mayor Lightfoot, and all gathered there in Chicago, to reflect upon the life and legacy of uh, Leon. Uh, we really miss him. Sorry that he's gone now. And I just want to give you my condolences and my appreciation for a life well lived. When you think about Leon, 
Junior, he, he just did so much in theology, in urban redevelopment and housing revitalization. He lifted people up from poverty and from uh, habitat slums to, to people just who lived a better life. So he was a go-to go man in Chicago uh, for anything having to do with economic development relative to housing. And what he did with the Woodlawn organization was remarkable, leading it to become one of the largest nonprofit housing management companies in America. I mean, so he was uh, he was he was a person that 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 built legacies. And then when he went to politics, he was even more instrumental, helping great folks in Chicago become mayor and president, folks like Jane Byrne and Harold Washington and when Jesse Jackson wanted to run for president, he called Leon Finney Jr. And then, you know, I saw a letter from Barack Obama who who also uh, did something in politics. So he all, uh, he revered Leon and uh, we all remember him. I'm so grateful he had an impact on my life and the life of so many of you there in Chicago and uh, and those uh, that I believe who are in the bottom one third when it comes to the economic strata. So I'm just so sorry. We celebrated his life today. I appreciate him. I'm so grateful to him for everything he did for me. There will never be another person like him. So thank you all. Please have my condolences and uh, see you later. Bye-bye. Man, at this time, Warren Jones, cousin of the deceased, and immediately following, Attorney James D. Montgomery Sr., James D. Montgomery and Associates Limited, managing partner. The uh, gentleman that you saw uh, was the cousin of Leon and my cousin. We're all first cousins. And uh, what uh, Leon did was to have uh, uh, fundraisers for Al. You know, I don't know if you know that, but Al is running for the Senate and the, not the great state of Mississippi, but the state of Mississippi. <laughs> if you know anything about Mississippi and the politics, uh, it, it's, uh, it's something else. If he wins, of course, he will be the first uh, black senator since uh, Reconstruction. And he has a chance, he has a very good chance. Uh, when I was thinking about what I could say about this man here, I think I've known him longer than anybody. I've known him over 70 some years, especially when he came from uh, Nashville and he came to be with his father who was, who was my uncle. And I asked my mother, I said, who is this young man? Who is, who is this? He said, that's your cousin. I said, oh, and over all the years that we were uh, cousins, it, it, it was more like brothers. It, it, it was a time that cousinness stopped and brotherhood went up forth. I followed him, his career for, for oh, for, for so, so many years. And he was uh, very supportive. And when you say that he, he came up and uh, lived in Woodlawn, Woodlawn for him and all of us was 6121 Roads. That was the family home, a three flat apartment. And of all the years that we were uh, uh, bonded, uh, we never had a harsh word to say to uh, each other, never. And when we would uh, see each other, you know, uh, after, after a while, there was always a glow in his face, in his eyes, and a hug for, uh, for uh, brotherhood. In the family, there were, there were uh, relationships and our relationship was, uh, came, up, came into three people. My cousin Sonny, who was not here anymore. Leon, 
who is not here, of course, and me. We were known as the Three Amigos. And the relationship we had as brothers was a strong one. And the support that we gave all our lives was great. You know him in a public way. I know him in a public way too, but I know him in a family way. And of all the years we were together, the support he gave me and the support Sonny gave me was great. I could tell you a lot of things, a lot of things, but I won't, I won't, no. But I will relate one thing that happened to show the kindness of his heart. When my mother died some years ago, uh, at the end of the ceremony, when you follow the casket and the minister says, I am the resurrection and the life, as I followed that casket, I lost it, I collapsed. Two people grabbed me and kept me from falling on the casket, Sonny, Leah, and they both grabbed me and they said, I have a family name, Junior. They said, Junior, and they held me and escorted me out of the church. He was complex. Sometimes people talked about him, but they didn't know him. They didn't know him. And I'm gonna miss him, because I loved him. And so, I had a, a nickname for him. I call him Big Time. Yeah, yeah. And so I say to you, Big Time, I'm gonna miss you. I'm gonna miss you, and I love you. Bishop Smith, distinguished clergy, uh, political officials, the distinguished speakers who've, who've said everything that needs to be said, and all of this wonderful family and the Finney family, I want everybody to just take a moment and realize that this is a celebration of life. We're gonna mourn in the morning but let's celebrate our life right now. Leon was a, first of all, a community organizer. Leon cared about the Woodlawn community and the black community in Chicago and across this country. Leon had a keen sense of politics and an understanding that power centers were places where he needed to have a relationship. I used to look at Leon and say once when I saw him the day after the, um, Harold Washington had won the primary, he had fought vigorously for Jane Byrne throughout her campaign and throughout her mayoralship, because he was loyal, as you have heard. The next day, I'm leaving work late at night, leaving downtown, and I run into Leon. He says, Leon says, Jim, where is Harold's campaign office? Because Leon knew darn well that he is going to present himself to this man, because this man can present things to his community. It didn't matter whether it was Mayor Daley, Mayor Byrne, Mayor anybody. He knew that that's where he had to have a seat at the table. You don't get to build monstrosities that he's built, a huge apartment buildings, individual home communities, 
over there on Stony Island Avenue, or those tall buildings that he managed for the CHA. You don't get those opportunities without having some political friends. Now, he's not asking for something for nothing. They've told you how he could bring a thousand people to the table if they were needed. How could he do this? Here's a man who had built thousands of low-income units for poor people. Thousands who had built and managed buildings in Illinois, in Chicago, and Indiana for buildings owned by HUD, thousands and thousands of units. What do you think that meant in terms of employment in our communities? He brought jobs to people who needed jobs. He put food on the table of people who would otherwise have been hungry. It was not just for the grandiosity of being able to be a great builder that he did that. He did that out of love for his community. I, I, I watched him when he was being trained by Saul Olensky. I thought that was a wild man. He probably was. But at least he taught him how to organize a poor, impoverished, underserved community and to build that community into a viable community where people could live in decent housing. So what, is it, what did he do politically? You know, everything that happened in Chicago over the last 50 years, 40 years, Leon has been a part of every movement in the black community. And you'd see people like um, Jim Compton or, or other leaders in the community who would basically uh, say, well, you better get Leon. You better get Leon. He can bring organization. He can bring people to the table. He can bring people to a protest. He can bring people to a political rally. He was a guy who knew how and who organized people. Christian and members of the family, you'll mourn his loss because it's a great loss. But remember when good, the good Lord decided that it was time to take him, he realized that he had spent the last year and a half with major health problems. I watched him through that period when he would be, have a vacation from the hospital, back to work, back to work preaching, back to work uh, with WCDC, back to work fighting battles with the government, back to work when, he was, when his body was getting weak and he was, he was really going down, downhill. I think the good Lord never makes mistakes. I think it was Leon's time. And I think that uh, you will realize that he is now at peace. And I think at this time that we owe you, as his family, a deep debt of gratitude for allowing him to spend a lot of his lifetime in behalf of the community. We thank you, and we cherish the memory of a man who has been described today as being loyal, loving, and caring of his community. <laughs> With that, I'm going to sit down and anything that the Montgomery family can do for you guys, just holler, all right? Cool. Man, thank you so much. I'm reminding of the song that Aretha Franklin sang, Precious Memories, How They Linger, How They Ever Flood Our Souls. At this time, a musical collection, Melanie Martin Ware and the AFC Praise Team, Total Praise.
Immediately following, we will have family tributes. Dr. Finney's son-in-law and grandchildren, Gerald, Ava, Liam, and Jaden Cook. And then reflections from Christian Finney Cook, the daughter of the deceased.
him a praise. Come on, bless him. Hallelujah. He's a source. He's not only our source, but he's our resource. Oh, yes, he is. Oh, yes, he is. Ooh, he's a strength. Ooh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I lift him in total praise to, to you. Bless the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. All is well. Death is nothing at all. I have only slipped into the next room. I am I and you are you, whatever we were to each other that we are still. Call me by my old familiar name. Speak to me in the easy way which you always used. Put no difference in your tone. Wear no forced air of sorrow. Laugh as we always laughed at the little jokes, jokes we enjoyed together. Play, smile, think of me, pray for me. Let my name be ever the household word that it always was. Let it be spoken without effect, without the trace of shadow on it. Life means all that it ever meant. It is the same at, as it ever was. There is unbroken continuity. Why should I be out of mind because I am out of sight? I am waiting for you for an interval somewhere very near just around the corner, All Is Well by Henry Scott Holland. Yeah. Okay. Oh. To Papa by Ava Rachel Finney Cook. He gave us food, he gave us his love, he gave us his heart. He dedicated his soul to the people he loved the most. He taught us all well and he will be always a part of us, but now he's with my Grandma Mayor and Uncle Trey. I, I like the things we go through together. I love when we went to Grandma Mayor's house together. I love being with you because we have done so much stuff together, and we also went to the pancake house to the I like that we were dressed alike with our bow ties. I liked racing with you on the way to school with you in the car and me on my scooter. I love being with you. I love you, Papa. I wish I could tell you something that you didn't know already about my father-in-law. The reality is that he touched many lives through his career of service. So as opposed to re reiterating to you what has already been shared, let me take a moment to speak about his legacy in another way, to his grandchildren as we stand before him. Now, as any parent may know, you literally have about two minutes for a child to hear everything that you need to say before they go off into their own childish engagement. So Jaden, Ava, and Liam, go get your Beats headphones, and I want you to listen <laughs> for the next two minutes, okay? Because what has been said about your papa, I'm going to tell it to you in another way. First of all, your grandfather loved his family and understood that your mother was his pride and joy. He loved her immensely. Equally, he also loved your Uncle Trey. However, there's a bond between daddies and, da and their daughters that is truly special. And that's what you saw between him and your mother. Let me tell you, he wanted to share that with you too. He adored you, all three of you. He never stopped talking about you. 
he rewarded you with ice cream, Starbucks frappuccinos, <laughs> all his afternoon school pickups, and let's not, my, let's not forget my least favorite of them all, iPads. He looked forward to spoiling you. And if he felt you deserved it, he took pride in it. He believed in you and that you were all going to be just fine. Your grandfather was a man of conviction. He was a man that meant what he said and said what he meant. He spoke from the heart and remained true to his game, which means that he remained true to himself. Passionately, he fought for what he believed in. He fought for people. He fought for his community. He fought for the South Side. That was what was in his heart and dedicated his life to it. He was consistent and he never wavered. You always knew where he stood and whether he was right or wrong. And with that, he unselfishly gave himself to help others. And as he was dedicated to serving his community, he was always a man in motion. His life hustle was seeing the need in the community and coming up with a plan to take care of it. He worked very hard because he knew a task needed to get done, a problem needed solving, a fire that needed to be put out, a church member needing prayer. He felt responsible and he would find a way to get the job done. He approached problems with a sense of urgency and always believed he could find a solution. There was never panic despite all odds. Your grandfather was a true Renaissance man, a man of class, always dignified, well-dressed, and prepared to take on the world. He lived life fully despite how hard he worked. He knew good music and could tell you about all the greats from Miles Davis to John Coltrane to Dizzy Gillespie to Dinah Washington to Count Basie to Duke Ellington, and the list goes on. And if you happen to be listening to some of that nice jazz, he may just chime in and let you know who you were listening to. But and it wasn't unusual to see him, from what I hear, at a nice jazz sat or two across town. But because he loved being amongst people the most, he always loved a good party, and he loved the elegance of drinking champagne, which is how I met him. It was November in 2002 at Allison Davis house. And after having a few glasses of champagne, we talked about the military, as I was in the Navy. We talked about your mother, and from there we hit it off. And then he, and when we hit it off, he leaned over and said, finally, I think I have somebody that may be able to get my daughter off my payroll. <laughs> <laughs> he told me to stick around your mother and that she really knew her stuff. And you know what? I guess you could say three years after that, he was right. He loved the Marines. And I know a little something about Marines having served in the, in the Navy. There's a saying that goes, once a Marine, always a Marine. But he wasn't just a regular Marine. He was what they referred to as a Hollywood Marine, for those of you who know the Marines. Because he was stationed at Camp Pendleton, which is in California, I would say that he would have embodied that term Hollywood Marine. If you knew him, he was never shot to a camera. However, as a Marine, he had to be regimented. He had to be organized. An organization requires discipline. He was disciplined and always had a routine for which he followed. Lastly, he was a man of faith and loved God. If you were having a trial, a painful moment, he always reminded you that you were in God's grace and mercy. He would encourage you to remain in prayer. And that's how he conducted his own life. And because of God's grace, I recall him often beginning his church service with a saying, God is good, and all the time, God is good. Although I can find so many other positive things to share with you about him, especially your mother, let's just start here. He has big shoes to fill, but the beauty is that you all get to be your own people. Your shoes are your own to wear, but to learn and draw inspiration from his path is a nice one to follow. I encourage you to create your own journey with your parents' assistance, of course. That's the way he would want you to do it. Your grandfather is leaving you a legacy of excellence to follow. Embrace it and always give your best. You have your mother and father's support. And to you, Dad, 
We love you. We miss you. And although we are here today with heavy hearts, we are in celebration of your life and legacy and know that you're in great hands now. Rest well in heaven and Semper Fi. Christian Finney Cook. Good morning. Welcome. Kristen Rachel Finney Cook. Martin Luther King once said, life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? This represents so much of my father. He woke up every day looking for ways to be of service to others. He was a servant to God, a servant to his community, a servant to his friends, and a servant to his family. Some say that the effect you have on others is the most valuable currency there is. By that measure, my dad was a wealthy man. I grew up sharing my dad with the community my entire life. He meant so much to Chicago, his church, and those who were blessed to call him a friend. He prided himself on being a friend to the friendless. He saw worth in everyone he met. But to me and my brother Trey, he was just daddy. And to my children, he was papa. My father was my hero. He was the perfect father for me. The first man I loved and who loved me unconditionally. I was his favorite daughter. I was. <laughs> he spent my entire life supporting me cheering me on. Imagine what it was like when I was a little girl. My father would sit at the dinner table and make the sound of a loud crowd roaring, his hands lifted in the air cheering. It's the President of the United States of America, Kristen R. Finney. Simple words and sentiments such as this strengthened my confidence and made me feel like I could accomplish anything. He always pushed us to be the best at whatever we chose to do in life. Add value, be purposeful, 
don't be a subtraction to society. In my younger years, daddy was the master fixer. As I matured, he taught me how to think critically and identify solutions on my own, always standing in the background as my chief advisor. He taught me to never give up and that failure was not an option. Failure was only achieved if I did not learn from my mistakes. He spent countless hours teaching me how to write critically. Be thoughtful, he would say, and always strategic. He also poured valuable people skills into me. Be mindful of others and let them know you care. Relationships, relationships, relationships make the world go round. Daddy, so much of who I am is because of the love you poured in me. You trained me up in the way of our family to appreciate the shoulders on which I stand. You came from a long legacy of leaders and resolved that I would know my ancestors and the expectations that were before me. I am a product of Leon Dorsey Finney Boot Camp, and I am prepared to carry on your legacy. As I lay you to rest today, I have a broken heart. However, I am joyous to know you are with the Lord our Savior. He called you home. And while you are a master negotiator on earth, our Lord is the true master. I was blessed, so blessed, to have you for a time. But It, but it is only right that Trey gets his time as well. You always made us both feel equally special. So, I know you are both smiling, laughing, and pointing in that joking manner. We always did when together and saying, look at Kristen, she needs to lighten up. It will all be okay. You are born a Finney. Hold it together and finish strong until we meet again. I love you, Daddy.
the daughter of a legend. I'm free. Don't grieve for me, for now I'm free. I'm following the path God laid for me. I took his hand when I heard him call. I turned my back. I left it all. I could not stay another day to laugh, to love, to work, to play. Task left undone must stay that way. I found that peace at the close of the day. If my parting has left a void, then fill it with remembered joy. A friendship shared, a laugh, a kiss. Ah, yes, these things I too will miss. Be not burdened with times of sorrow. I wish you the sunshine of tomorrow. My life's been full. I've savored much. Good friends, good times, and yes, a loved one's touch. Perhaps my time seemed all too brief. Don't lengthen it now with undue grief. Lift up your heart and share with me. God wanted me now. He set me free. At this time, a final musical selection, Melanie Martin Ware and the AFC praise team, His Eyes on the Sparrow. And the next speaking voice you will hear will be the Honorable Bishop Horace E. Smith, MD, the Bishop of the Sixth Episcopal District of the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World, a friend of this great legend, and also the pastor of this great church. Hear them as they come.
to say amen. Come on, give the Lord praise for Melanie Martin Ware. Tremendous presentations. Well, God bless you. And isn't it paradoxical to say how great a time this is? There are thousands who are watching by way of internet and others who could not be here. And so many of you have been so patient this, this morning. But we're here for purpose. And that makes it all worthwhile. You know, we are frail human beings and we struggle with so many things. But our solace is that there's a God who knows everything. Yeah. We're dealing with days and times that we never thought would happen. Situations that we could not have dreamed or imagined. But we stand in the face of an omniscient God who knows every single thing. You heard the song, His Eye. If His Eye is on the sparrow, then you do know He cares about you. You feel lonely, you feel disenfranchised, you feel disconnected. The honoree today was a master at helping people to become connected again. So even though it's a Saturday and we're struggling with mixed emotions of celebration yet mourning, we sit together as a family. We watch together as people that are connected by a faith that is resilient, that is real, that is palpable. And I will not hold you long. I have a lot of thoughts about this man. I grew up in my pastorate with him right here. We talked many times about issues that people never knew about. And so I don't want to repeat what's been said. I, uh, my brother, uh, De Byron said it right, you know, and, and, and Hermine straightened us out too. He was complex. But the truth is we're all complex. The truth is that as complex as we are, we are unique. The Bible says by the mouth of David, I will praise thee, O Lord, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. The tragedy of, of COVID and the tragedy of structural racism is this. We have left our common humanity. That's what it talks, you know what COVID's about? You know, we've forgotten that we're all frail, fragile, and in need of one another. That's what it's taught us. That's, that, this unveiling of structural racism exposes a country that stands on a premise that it will not enforce. It shows us again that until we come together and until we understand how complex and yet how simple we are. And until we begin to value what he learned as he walked with God, we're gonna always be in trouble. To this family that's done a tremendous job, Kristen and all of you, your friends and those that we've worked with over the weeks, it has been our pleasure to serve someone who epitomizes the word service. Give God praise for this family. All those that worked with them and to our church staff, to my wife who knew Leon longer and in fact, I think babysat for him. That's amazing, you, you're so young but you babysat for Kristen, is that right? Okay, well God, my wife of 44 years, Susan Smith, amen. Well, as a pastor, I, I, I take what I'm called to very seriously. Uh, a few weeks ago, uh, Dr. Finney uh, sat right over there uh, at a home going of one of his close friends, Sylvia Franklin. Then in that service, he, he was there for the entire time. He went home and he called me. It wasn't six in the morning, but he called me. He said, Horace, I want to let you know something now, man. I sat there in that church and I just wept and I was not sad. I said, I realized 
what this church means to me. I want to let you know that. If anything happens to me, I want you to take care of those arrangements and do a good job because I feel at home right here. It's amazing to me that no matter who we are, when we begin to understand the critical nature of life, we're able to focus in like a laser on what's important. And we forget about the public knowledge of us that, as we've heard, some just simply use to throw darts at you and criticize. But if no one's talking about you, then you're not doing anything anyway. And so to hear him say how comfortable he felt, he didn't know how good that made me feel. And he told me that he trusted us. Somebody who has been there for everybody else, you don't understand, is often in their own sense lonely because we see them as these giants. We, don't, we forget that they are just as frail and as human as we are. So maybe the lesson of what I want to share with you is let's do and try to do and understand what he understood. We are too disconnected. We are too self-serving. We have not appreciated each one of us in the way that we need to. And until we do that, we're going to always be in the midst of a human pandemic. So as my friend transitioned, they called me my church will tell you, I always ask the Lord, if I'm to speak at this service, what is the text? Because in these days of chaos, there's one thing that keeps me centered. It is the Word of God. And I will tell you that the Lord gave me this text for Dr. Finney. I'm clear about it. And I will read just three verses from the fourth chapter of the book of Ephesians verse 1, and then verses 15 and 16. Now, I want to read it in the authorized or King James Version, but then I want to read it in the classic Amplified Version, and I will not be long. Here's what the Lord said to me concerning this man. Paul writes, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, I beg you, I beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation to which you are called. Verse 15. How do you do that, Lord? By speaking the truth in love. You may grow up into him, Christ, all things which is the head. And then verse 16, I thought was just personal to me about Leon. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part makes increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. A little complex. Let's read it in the classic amplified version about living this life worthy. Paul says, rather let our lives be lived lovingly, expressing truth in everything, speaking truly, dealing truly, living truly. Enfolded in love, let each of us grow up in every way in him who is the head, even Christ. Because of him, the whole body, the church in all its various parts, closely joined and firmly knit together by the joints and ligaments where which it is supplied when each part with power adapts to its needs, it will work properly and function and be mature in itself. The question Paul writes and asks us is the question, is your life worthy to the call?
Can you justify your space here? What Paul says is that in a divine way, God, as you've heard before, don't make no junk. The Bible says God makes every single human being in his image, after his likeness. All of us are made to look like God. All of us are made with profound gifts and abilities that only a God could give. And so, what a great gift we have. But, but then he asks us the responsible question. So, since you are so blessed, and since you are so gifted, and since you are so talented, how are you living your life? Can you honestly say that you justify the life you're living? Can you honestly say that look at what Paul says you're living according to the vocation to which you are called you, you Greek scholars my, my, my former fellow pastors here you know what this says it, it says this are you are, are you living to high enough to justify the calling that God called you with we can talk all day and we should about all of the secular accomplishments that Dr. Finney did, but if you do only that, you miss the core truth. The core truth is not that he was secular. The core truth is that he realized he was called by God. In my church, we have this thing about money, and they say, Doc always talks about money because I believe the church has allowed the world to make money carnal. So we are afraid to demand that people support the church monetarily because you have made money carnal. But I tell them this, money is only carnal in the hands of carnal people. If the church is living the character of the church, then the church ought to have money because the church is not a beggar, it should be a leader in what it's doing. I refuse to dumb down the gospel of the church. I refuse to be intimidated by the popular lie about spirituality. You missed the boat about spirituality. All of us are spiritual beings, whether we acknowledge it or not. And if we don't get ourselves together, we're going to lose a whole lot. And so the Bible says to us, and it said to Leon, and God spoke to him and said, Are you walking worthy? Are you walking worthy? And, you, and worthy is nothing about comparing to somebody else. Worthy is comparing to the gifts that God has given you. You can't say you did more than she did because you ain't she. To walk worthy, you must measure up to the divine deposit that God put in you. And if you don't, you can perpetrate among the people. But we know the truth because when God gives you a lot, he expects a lot. Why are we surprised at this momentous occasion to hear speaker after speaker talk about decades upon decades of excellent, tireless service. God gifted him with such gifts, he had to ask himself, am I willing to do it? The truth is, many leaders will not truthfully answer the question. They won't even deal with the question. They cop out by the popular image of who they are. That's why what they say in the Sun Times don't mean a thing to me. What they said on the news don't mean a thing to me. My hope is built on the call of God in my life. I know this man, he walked through some things that you will never know about, but he always did it to the glory of God. You cannot besmirch his image. He did what he did even in the times when he was complicated, but he did it because there was something on the inside that he valued and it drew him to a commitment that many never live up to. He made his calling, his election sure. I, I, I've been in thousands of funerals. I sit in funerals all the time and we have to stretch and find out good things to say about people. We have to almost lie in the pulpit. But when you find people from every walk of life say that Leon Finney Jr. was committed to the cause, you know that ain't no fake. You cannot fake consistency. You cannot fake decades upon decades of commitment. You can't fake that. To 
too many fakes in leadership. That's the problem. But when you understand the call that Paul says, he says, live justly, justify your existence. If I had time, I'd break it down when he talks about in, in verse number 15 about speaking truth. You, I don't need to tell y'all that too many leaders today are just born liars. There is no truth in them. Jesus said, when they speak the truth, they lie. Figure that one out. Chew on that for a minute. When they speak a fact, they lying because they're trying to deceive somebody. This man was no fake. This man was no cheat. This man lived out his life. Was he perfect? Are you? I'm tired of folks. What he did. What did you do? What if? Can I preach for a little while? I ask my church when it comes to grace, what would happen if God decided to hire uh, a movie director to, to tell the story of your life and he gave the director insight to everything you ever did, said, or thought about. But, oh Jesus, if everything about you was told, who could stand in the judgment? But God who is rich in mercy, God who understands that we are frail and we are pitiful, but he will make us understand the purpose of our life now God has somebody he can trust. And so then Paul talks about this. He, he tells us to walk worthy. After this service is over, ask yourself, are you walking worthy? Because just being on a program on a funeral means nothing if you leave here and don't walk worthy. Because lives are lived to demand the best out of us, not the worst out of us. The life, Jesus, I sat there hearing these people. I watched every video before I got here. I said, wow, look at what God did through a single individual. What if we had 10 in Chicago like Dr. Leon Dorsey Finney? What if we had 10 like that? He lived and he justified the life that he lived. He lived in a way that, as you've already heard enumerated, from family to the person on the street to the drug addict to the gangbanger, he was appropriate to every single one of them because he understood the purpose of his life. What I wanted to preach was the, was the 16th verse. I'll just touch it. The Bible here says, uh, from whom the whole body fitly joined together. And you know that intrigued me because I happened to be trained in that. From whom the whole body fitly joined together. You know, you can't just be connected. You must be connected appropriately. Sometimes we are connected to the wrong thing and in the wrong way but when God calls you he expects you to connect with the right people at the right time Hermine when you talk about what happened behind that door nothing but what God wanted ain't their business you guys were connected in a cause that God had called you to and he gave Leon the insight to say let's open up some mail and got six million dollars as a result of it when you are properly connected God will always open a door that no man can shut and he will shut a door that no man can open. I declare in 2020, if you do God's work and do God's will, he will bless you and nobody can curse you. He will bless you and use you until he says to you, well done, come on home. The body, I was going to take you through a whole litany of things about the body. I was going to tell you that when God decided to be a creator, the word says he spoke a word. He spoke a word. There was no galaxy. There was no universe. I know some of y'all don't believe it, but that's just your loss. God said, let there be a Milky Way. Let there be a universe. Do you know that there are over 200 mil billion documented galaxies in existence? Now, your mind can't even think about that. There are over 200 billion documented galaxies in this universe. And every galaxy has over 200 billion billion stars in it, not counting planets. And you gonna tell me that it happened by chance? You gonna tell me that it happened just out of nothing? Are you stupid or what? Don't 
Don't you know that great minds and physicists have looked at the Milky Way, this universe, and have concluded there are 109 characteristics in this universe that must be finely tuned all the time if they ever get off by 0.001% that life could not exist and you would not be breathing? You tell me that's by chance? I tell you no. There's a God that deliberately put this stuff together. He said, let them be in that was. All the depth of the riches of the glory of God. Look at how great our God is. He's a great God. He made the universe, but that ain't nothing. When it comes to you, 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 you look at the universe and get all excited. Look at yourself. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are made of 37 trillion cells in your body and, and you, you, you live every day a miracle and don't even give God the glory. You got this morning and ate some eggs and you drank some coffee. You thought it was nothing. But those eggs and coffee should have poisoned you. But they didn't because God made your GI system in a way can break down those biochemical particles of anything that you eat, put it in your system and make sure that it gets nutrients to every one of the 37 trillion cells in your body. How does that happen? You stupid intellectual people. It's a God that did that. It's a God that put you together. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. And then God takes that same analogy and says about people like Leon Finney of whom the whole body the whole body fitly joined together when every member of the body will operate in the profound divine purpose of God then we won't have these community deserts like we have them. What drove him was he said that God made all of us just as better as anybody else. It's a shame you can almost predict with 85% accuracy the outcome of our young kids by their zip code. By their zip code. Do you understand the heinous disease that is that you can predict how long a kid will live, his quality of life, his level of education by his zip code? That means that this system is toxic and somebody needs to stand up and say enough is enough and begin to change it. It's heinous and the church is often silent. Don't let me go there. But Paul says about this, because our time is up, of whom the whole body, genie, the whole body, the, this is what the Bible says. Look, the Bible says, that, look, if every one of us who calls Jesus Lord, if everyone who said I'm a Christian would live out the call of God on your life, do you know that you would bring health to your neighborhood? You bring health to your family? You bring health to your neighborhood? Because something on the inside would push you like it pushed him. That's why he was tireless. That's why he was able to overcome stuff that most folk would have quit long time ago because he had something in him. People laugh at this because they knew Leon Finney when. I remember a story when one of, one of my in-laws, I won't say who it was, came to our other church that, that, that if it hadn't been for Leon Finney, wouldn't have been built. But, but, but he was a part of our board of trustees. And, and, and we were having some kind of celebration. And, and he came in and he sat there and he, and he looked up and he saw, he saw the Finney. He said, he said, he said is, is, that, is that who I think it is? Is that Leon Finney? I said, yeah. He said, you let him count the money? I said, yeah. He said, Doc, you better be careful. I said, you, you knew him on a level that I know him differently. I know him in his character. I can trust him with anything. See, people have these popular stories about you, and most of them are lies. You heard the story. If he wanted to, he could have been a multi millionaire. He did not do what he did. Even when he did not always perhaps check every box, it's because the nature of government money. No, now you're going to make me preach now. See, that's why in our church, I, I, I stay away from it. I said, Jesus, because I don't want no official telling me how to teach or preach or run this church. I have been called by God. Look, this man, what he did, whatever he did, he did it for the good of the community. And we ought to applaud him right now in the name of Jesus. But here's my point as I close. He was one of those dynamics that was fitly joined. Fitly joined, and that's only the beginning of Paul's. Fitly joined means joined appropriately. Then he says, and it was compacted. 
It means that when you are fitly joined, God will leverage your gift greater than you could ever leverage on your own. You will be exponentially more effective. Like, how did he do that? Because God was with him. Fitly joined, compacted. The whole body full of life. I thought about him in terms of this term that somebody said twice today about community organizer. I thought, wow. He must have read Ephesians 4. He must have understood that if everyone would do what is right by God, we bring healing to our, it would be the beloved community. This is not a, this is not a zero issue population. There's enough wealth in this world to go along to everybody. But if we don't dignify each other on every level, then we minimize who people are. He didn't do that. He learned how to have fun, but he loved his family. He loved his church. To Metropolitan, we're praying for you. Your pastor had a great dream, a great vision. I went down to Metropolitan last week, and I, I, I went down to the basement. And went, oh, my God, they, they need some help here. And we ought to help them, too, in the name of Jesus, the best that we can. You better hear what I'm saying. We, we must learn that the life that we have is also responsibility. And if you respect this man, like I have done this week, you will look and say, Lord, am I walking worthy? Am I committed to doing better? Am I sold out to a cause that's bigger than me? Or am I self-centered like many of our leaders and disconnected from the people? My brother, my friend, you have fought the good fight. You have finished your course. You have kept the faith. When we go to the cemetery, he won't be there. I, I appreciate how our culture is, and, but he ain't there. The, the moment the Lord took him, his spirit, for to be absent from the remains is to be present with the Lord. Even right now, he's, yeah, you talked about Trey and your, and your mother. Yeah, look, he is not suffering. He, he is with God right now. The Bible says it. When this earthly house of this tabernacle for a year and a half, as you pointed out, he was going through health challenges. But listen to me. We all going to go through something health-wise. But guess what? When this earthly house of this tabernacle is dissolved, we have a building, a, a house not made with hands. It is right now eternal in the heavens. And we groan to have it. That's another sermon. Stop there, Horace. All right. Yeah, we groan for it. Let's pray. Let's pray for this family, and, and let's pray for Metropolitan. Let's pray for our city. Let's pray for our nation. If you have real courage, you will pray for your president, because he's crazy. Uh, and I, yeah, 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 yeah. You'll pray for those that have despitefully used you. Ooh, you'll, who? Okay, Horace, let's, yeah, yeah, you, you'll do the Christian thing, the, the godly thing that still has power. In that text, check out the Amplified Version when you get a chance. It says, when we all work together, we'll be empowered to do what we ought to do together. Our Heavenly Father, in the master's name of Christ our Lord, we thank you for the example that cannot be faked. We thank you for a consistency that thousands of us have seen and observed and understand how great we can be in your hands. I thank you for this family. They are heavy today because they have lost something, Lord. Let them realize the pain they feel is the cost of genuine love. They miss because he was so precious to all of us. But God, let there be hundreds and thousands who will rise up because of his example, whether in theology, in business, in civic affairs, whatever it may be, God, but let them rise up and emanate the same qualities that you have demonstrated in this life. Thank you now, God, for him, for his church, for his loved ones. Thank you for our world. We pray in Jesus' name that the church will become the church and live out its true legacy. Now, God, as we leave and go to the final preparations, be with us, go with us, use us for your glory, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Give God great praise today. Give him great praise. We're going to proceed from here uh, to uh, the cemetery and to the mausoleum. Uh, I will ask you to follow the examples and the directions 
uh, of our directors today uh, as we proceed out. I will ask you, if you're not the family, simply to stand uh, and allow the family to recess out uh, in a proper manner in Jesus' name. God bless you. Amen. We'd also like for those that are going to assist us with flowers, if you would meet us in the back, we would greatly appreciate it. Ladies that will assist with the flowers. And we need a couple of you to come to the front now, please. Will the congregation please stand? You come and walk with me with the family, just come. You've been so patient. All of our pastors, come. We'll walk in front of the family as they proceed out. And please make sure you have all of your personal belongings, your keys, your electronic devices. Ministers here. Pastors. Hurry. 